Well, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. I'm really pleased um, to represent the association at, at an event such as this. Um, obviously, in January, my organisation, uh, Reed Vale, started to have different kinds of discussions with Market Gallery because um, we've been faced with We've been faced with quite a horrible dilemma, to be honest with you, and that is the closure of the Crown Post Office, which is just across the road. So when this came about, you know, um, I've been the chairperson for Reed Vale for, for two years. I've, I've been in the committee for 2005, um, since 2005. For that whole time, Market Gallery has always been here. I've, I've always felt quite proud that, you know, we've supported an initiative such as Market Gallery with with the, the spaces that we provide for them. And I also, um, I, know, I know lots of people who've been in the committee in the past, and I know a lot of people that are, I've, I've met the board as well. And um, I know Margaret, who's the chairperson very well. So when this, this issue came up about the, the closure of the, the Crown Post Office across the road, I thought, God, why did this, why did this have to happen now? And why, did it, why is it? myself and, and Margaret that are having to start having this discussion about it. So um, we met with the board in January, um, myself and the, the Reedvale team and the board from Market met in January and we started to discuss, you know, basically the past 15 years and um, where we are now and why we're in this position. But what, what was really good about those discussions was how even though the association will have to relinquish these spaces. I do, we do believe, we all believe that there's perhaps a more interesting dialogue to be had about how the gallery moves forward, how the gallery and Reed Vale exist together, and um, how we can, you know, how we can work together. A big issue for, for us as a housing association at the moment is community engagement, and there's possibly, um, you know, a, a bigger discussion to be had there. So, yeah, that's the situation. We found out in January that, that the post office across the road will be closing. You might be wondering, why is that, why is that such a big deal? Um, it's, it's a big deal for us as, as a housing association. We have, um, well, we have about just over 908 households. We currently know at the moment that about 30% of our tenants that live in this area can only have post office accounts. And they can only have post office accounts because for a lot of people, you know, you, you can't just go and choose a bank account. You've got to think about where um, where you can get your, your, your benefits paid into. Can you set up direct debits for certain things? And we know that about 30% of our tenants can only use that post office as a bank resource. So that's, that's a big issue. Another issue for us as well is directly behind this building. There's a, a building called John Butterley House. Um, I dare say none of you have ever been there because it's for it's a place where, where older people live and um, all those people need to access the post office on a regular basis. So why here? Here because um, we own this building. This building was built in the early 90s and uh, you've probably looked along the, the shop fronts here. The two shops in between these units uh, Reedvale sold them and then these units are ours, the one at the corner is ours and the, the credit union next door as well, is, you know, that's a similar deal, they're, they're in this building because they're our shop units and the credit union provides a really valuable resource for the community. A lot of people save with the credit unit, they get loans with the credit union, um, someone from the credit union is actually on our um, committee as well. So. There's, there's a lot of close connections there. But um, yeah, it's, it's been a really difficult time. And um, I wanted to explain as well, because I was worried, you know, I was worried that Reed Vale, the Housing Association, would, would kind of look a wee bit like the big bad landlord here, you know, thinking, well, we'll just take the galleries back and we'll get rent off the post office. When these spaces become a post office facility, we probably won't collect rent from that for quite a long time either because we have to negotiate a good deal to keep the post office in our area. 
But I'm also worried that people think too that we think, oh, well, it's just the gallery. The galleries, um, you know, they can, they've had their time. That's that's the end of the relationship. And I'm horribly, co you know, I'm conscious of that all the time, and I don't want that to happen because I believe that the gallery can play a key part in in future development of this community and how people can can access different kinds of art and culture. It's also, um, you might wonder why Reed Vale chose to put the, the galleries in these spaces in the first place. Reed Vale doesn't have, um, you know, if you look along this street here, there's loads of like takeaway shops. And on this side, you know, there used to be some pawn shops, there's bookies. And when we built this building, I'm saying we as if I was here at the time, it was back in the 90s. But when we built this building, Rob Joyner, who was the director of Reed Vale at the time, decided that he didn't want this to be another, like, I don't know, like another bookies or another um, tanning shop or a kebab shop. It, they should, there should be something better. There should be something more for our tenants. And that's why um, I think before it was market, the gallery was Fly Gallery. And there was an approach made to the association to ask if if they could occupy these spaces, and and that that was agreed. And I think at the time it was intended that Fly would maybe be here for I don't know a couple of years, three years until someone else moved in, and the the project just developed. The gallery, you know, put down a lot of roots here, and here we are, 15 years later, um, still still using the spaces. So. Um, yeah, I thought it would be a good idea to maybe... I put my presentation together a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not sure like what order my slides in, but I'll try and use them to guide me. What I thought I would do was just kind of explain what Reedvale Housing Association is, kind of what, what's affecting housing associations at the moment, politically, generally. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the, the history of this area too. Um, because the association was 40 years old last year. And you may also have seen as well that before the Commonwealth Games, the BBC made a programme about this area called The History of Our Streets. And it actually told quite an incredible story about, about how this area has involved, evolved. So I'd really like to share that with you all as well. Um, so I'll see, see. Yeah, it's a, a picture of, um, I think it's a big Ian Kettle's ladder from I can't put a date on it, I'm sorry, but um, I think that was probably maybe about eight or ten years ago. Um, so that was in 1989. But just to, just to introduce myself a little bit further, um, my name's Helen Moore. I've been the chairperson of Reed Vale Housing Association for two years. I've been on the committee since 2005. I'm also um, I'm the vice chair of an organisation called Glasgow West of Scotland Forum. And we're a membership organisation for housing associations. And what we do is um, we, we champion the work that community controlled housing associations do. And we also um, we lobby in parliament on behalf of our members. So when issues come up that affect the affordable housing sector, actually, I don't really like the term social housing. So I, I may use it by accident, but I don't actually like the term. But um, what we what the forum does is we'll, we'll lobby in Parliament for um, things that come up in government that, that we don't agree with. Um, a couple of those recently have been housing associations becoming subject to freedom of information. We believe that we give all our tenants all the information they need anyway. And it's just another pressure on our staff to, to respond to any inquiries within two working weeks. We're also fighting the possibility that we may well become public bodies. A lot of housing associations are, you know, we're, we're public organisations, we're, we're charities as well. But if you're a public body, it's almost like being a, a government arm. You know, it's a bit like what Natalie was talking about, where, you know, you, you become, once you become embroiled in that, it's very hard to get back out of it again. And I think that... Um, we were set up 40 years ago because a lot of our tenants, a lot of our areas were failed by public bodies. So the thought that the government can turn around and say to us again, yeah, you're, you're going to become a public body and this is how you're going to be constituted. 
is going to be, it's, it's really quite irksome. Just have written down other things here. There's a lot of other things that, that we campaign about to, you know, what there's up and coming universal credit. I'm sure you've, you've all heard about about that in the news and how that's going to affect our tenants, how they can how they can pay their rent, the sanctions they'll face if they don't pay their rent, if not their rent, but the sanctions they'll face if they don't show up to justify their benefits on time. The whole thing is it's all set on penalising people. It's not it's not about helping them, I don't think anyway. A lot of people Probably some people in the room here today as well are affected by zero hours contracts. Do you know, I think um, as the forum um, and uh, housing associations in general, all these other little issues that are out there come into affect our operations and, and we try and work hard to deal with that. One of the other things that um, the government tried to impose on us recently was um, paying committee members. This was something, it was a campaign I was involved in about five years ago where um, they wanted, you would sit on a committee but all committee members would get paid to do that and we thought that was wrong because that would, I feel that would entirely skew people's motivations for sitting on a community-led housing association board and doing the best for people living locally. And one of the other things that we've campaigned against recently is um, having professionals on the board. I think that's, that's fine if you've got spaces on your board, and I think it's fine if um, you know you need that particular advice at, at a particular time, but our, our committee is, and our board is entirely made up of people that live in this area that bring an amazing amount of skills and experience to the role, and they, um, you know, we don't need to bring anyone else in to, to kind of enhance that. So these are all the things that, as a housing association, we're, we're currently facing. You know, I feel quite often as the chairperson of a housing association, we're firefighting a lot of government policy. We're constantly, there's always something else coming up. The latest thing um, that we've been dealing with has been the, the end of the right to buy. I'm sure a lot of you in the room have heard of the right to buy, but the right to buy um, was, was finished in Scotland in 2012, and basically that allowed housing association tenants to buy their property at a 75% discount. And in Scotland, we decided to you know, get rid of that because it was eradicating the, the housing stock, which is of major importance, hasn't been eradicated in England, but the final you know, people who qualified for the right to buy had to buy their property by September 2016 and that meant that we lost about 12 flats in the past year. That's about £30,000 per annum in rent, which is, um, you know, it's, it's difficult but possibly we'll use that, that money from those sales to go back into the community resource. So sorry, that was a sort of whistle-stop tour of just all the, the issues that are affecting an operating housing association at the moment. I joined the Reedvale Committee because, well, I joined for a number of reasons, but it was when I got my flat in this area, which I love living in, by the way, I really love living over in this, this side of the, of the street. Um, the Reedvale area is from Duke Street to Reedvale Street, and from Belgrove Street over to Millerston Street. So all the tenements on this side of the road are our stock. Um, we've, since the 1970s, the organisation has redeveloped a thousand, just over a thousand tenements, and we still have um, 900 of them in community controlled ownership. So when I, um, when I moved into my flat here, I was absolutely delighted. I think um, I'm, I'm one of these people I'll probably you know, ne never own my own house and this is, this is the next best thing for me. So I felt so pleased to be part of this community and so pleased to be part of this organisation which does so much locally that I thought I would join the committee and, and I would find out what was happening. When I did join, I was, I was quite surprised to find that some of the people that are on our committee now were the original people, you know, who had sold their houses back to the association in the 70s, and I'll, I'll go into how that happened just shortly. But some of our, I know um, we find it difficult to find new committee members, but a lot of our committee members have been with us for 25, 30 years. 
I'm one of the younger ones at 37 and, and I've been on since 2005. I'm still one of the newer committee members in, in their eyes. So, you know, we're talking about that kind of longevity within, the committee, within our committee and that, that absolute commitment that people, people are terrified, I think. People are terrified that what's going on at the moment, what you hear in the news, is going to happen again. You know, people are going to be struggling again the same way they were 20, 30 years ago. And sometimes it's not that hard to imagine. I also um, joined the committee because I learned that the, the average age of a committee member in a housing association is 57 years old. I found that absolutely astonishing. And yeah, I was 20, 20 odds at the time when I joined. So um, I think even if I was a completely crap committee member, Reedvale would be delighted that, that I joined because <laughs> I brought the, the average age down quite significantly. And, um, but the main reason I'm still on the committee, and it's, it's hard work and it's a big commitment, but the re main reason I'm still on it is because I get so pissed off when I see how, okay, I'll say it, social housing is perceived in the news and in the press and in programmes in Channel 5, like dogs on benefits and benefit bins and, you know, I, I just find it absolutely outrageous that people make these programmes and, and other people watch them and they think that that's what the sector's all about. And a lot of the stuff that community controlled housing associations do is incredible and it's done with volunteers and it's done to mitigate problems in, our, in communities and it's done without any external support whatsoever. So it was that perception of associations in the press and, well, well I've seen everyone's names get dragged through the mud when the, when the bedroom tax came out and that was another big issue which had to be fought there and then because it was just so disgusting and it was the, th the thought that people who, you know, are perhaps living on benefits and they're living in these huge two, three bedroom flats alone that the pop, that other people are paying for. The whole thing was just so divisive. It was time for it was time for, for these messages to get changed. So that was why that's kinda why why I, I do what I do at the association today. My committee are fantastic. Um, they're really feisty. They're a scary bunch. There's about <laughs> eleven of them at the moment. And they all bring different experience to, to the table. So there's myself, I've actually, you know, I work for an arts organisation, I've got an arts background. Um, I'm really quite interested in the policy side of things and making sure we're up to date with, with new legislation and, and new, new um, government policies that might affect us. Uh, there's my, my colleague Eddie, who is just all about community. He does a lot of the, he's the chair of the community engagement subcommittee. He's just, he's a force to be reckoned with. And you've got people like Irene who, you know, is, has worked in, she led a dementia team up in um, Postle Park for Glasgow City Council and is, you know, is all about making sure that people feel included. No one's lonely, no one's sitting on their own. Uh, there's another lady who, um, well, Davina manages the credit union next door. So there's just this amazing range of people who in this bottom down structure for the association come and meet about four times a month and as and when whenever to discuss how we can keep the area running. But I did mention as well, we find it really difficult to get new committee members. And I think that's because, I guess if, if you were to move in here today, you'd think, yeah, this is all right. Rent's really reasonable. If something's broken, I'll phone Michael at the office and he'll come and fix it. You know, it's got to get fixed within two or three working days. And you would move in and you'd think, this is fine. This is absolutely fine. So I, I get frustrated with my committee because quite often they'll, they'll hark back to, like, the 70s and the 80s when you did sit-ins and, you, you know, you... You went out with placards and there was no social media and campaigning was very different and you, they'll be quite ready to say, we done that, we done that in the 70s, we did that in the 80s, it didn't work her, it did work her. And we have these arguments all the time and I think there's, if you were a new person that wanted to join a housing association committee, 
you realise that all these people have got so much history. Like Irene, I, I think her house is in one of my slides. They've sat in their house to stop it from getting demolished. And how, when, when people have set up a committee that many years ago, how can you compare that with now, when people don't want to get bogged down and they want to help people join a housing association to help their local area. They don't join to kind of get bogged down in what the Freedom of Information Act might mean for us. Do you know, there's so much technical stuff and real responsibility, real responsibility that I, I don't think people are are up for and I guess there's a sense of complacency as well whereas everything works fine if there does if there isn't any big perceived crisis then people don't really feel the need to to get out there and campaign or go to their committee and say this is what what needs to happen so yeah that's um that's kind of my reasons for for joining let's see what the next slide is okay um I'll tell you, <laughs> sorry, I'll tell you a little bit about the history of Reedvale and this area, which I described as this big rectangle of tenements on this side of Duke Street. This is where we are sitting now, in about 1974. So this area was um, horrendous. A lot of the flats weren't fit for purpose. Um, there was a lot of rogue absentee landlordism. So do you know where landlords lived elsewhere? The tenants would pay the rents. They didn't, they didn't care if your ceiling was hanging in or if you had a huge hole in your floor. Um, they would, you still, people were still paying rent to these people anyway. Few owners dotted about as well. And then a lot of derelict, a lot of dereliction. What Eddie, again, who's on our committee, the, the, commu the, the guy who's all about community, he lived in Sword, he was brought up in Sword Street. I really wanted him to come with me today just so he could tell you a little bit about, you know, his, some of his stories. But, you know, he was telling me that in their flat in Sword Street, no one else lived in the block. So there was Eddie and his mum and dad and his seven sisters. And they would just they would just knock holes through into other rooms, and they had the luxury of running through this whole <laughs> this whole block of tenements. And you know, it's so hard to imagine that. But for him, that's a, like one of his key memories, which is he really likes sharing with people. So it used to be, um, you know, really grim. And that's just another shot. So that's um, I think that's the corner of. You've got Sword Street here. I can't remember what the, no, the Sword Street's there, isn't it? And then that's, no, that's Sword Street. Good. And then there's that little short one next to the pub. So that's the little short street. That's where the corner, the corner unit is of this building on that side. So all shored up, um, all falling to bits. And this is a, a kind of typical dwelling that would have been in this, this area at the time in the 1970s. So this would have been a, a single end flat. I um, can't remember. Yeah, that's a shot from the other side, but, you know, the bed recess would be here. There would be a shared toilet on the landing. Uh, that's that person's cooker. So the whole house would have just been in, in one room, you know, and you think, oh, yeah, well, it was the mid-70s. It's actually not that long ago, and um, it's, it's really pretty bad. So that's another couple of just single ends. That's what, what flats in this area used to, used to look like. Um, And this is a quote from our first chairperson, who was a man called John Butterley. And John was just an ordinary wee guy. He lived in Bathgate Street, worked in the shipyards, and um, he'd lived in this area all his life. And although, you know, I've, I've described it in, in quite a poor way, he was immensely proud to, to live here. And um, what happened was there was a, a council planning meeting because this whole area was for the hammer, it was coming down. And um, a lot of our tenants, well, they, wouldn't have been, they would have just been tenants at the time, and John Butterley went to a local meeting with the planning department and they said, this area is going to get demolished and um, you're, all, well, you're all going to get reallocated housing in, in Easter House. And some people were, were horrified. You know, back in the mid-70s, 
that's when Easter House was starting to get, there was, I think there was that Billy Connolly song, Desert with Windies, you know, that had, the buses wouldn't go out there, um, there was no shops. I'm not knocking Easter House now, I quite like Easter House, but um, at the time, people were like, no, we're not moving, no way. And John Butterley stood up at the meeting with the planners and he said, you can go to Easter House if he's want, but I'm going to stay here. And what John did was he formed the first local committee that um, started to, to make the changes. And they, so he put that committee together in 1975. I've got a photo there. That's John there. Probably at one of those parties that, that you see good pictures of in the 80s that don't happen anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's, that's maybe a community development thing. Um, so yeah, just an ordinary wee guy, and he put the, the first committee together, and that was a group of local owners who had, had the misfortune at the time of owning a flat in this area and were watching the area fall to bits. So what all those people collectively done was they sold their flats back to the association, and that meant that they could start to, you know, they had a little bit of capital, but what they also done was they persuaded other owners in the area to sell their flats back to the association as well. And with that little bit of capital that they had, they started to, you know, redevelop a couple of flats. There's a wee couple moving out. They started to redevelop a couple of flats and that involved them, um, you know, sandblasting, putting a toilet inside the actual flat as opposed to out the back or in the landing. <coughs> and then, um, you know, just fitting, fitting little kitchens and things as well. And as soon as they started to do that, more people in this area thought, well, I want a piece of that action. I want, I'd quite like that as well. So the act of, there was no, you know, there was no council support at the time because, or, or government support, because what they thought was that area should be demolished. It should just come down. So, um, People had to do it on their own, and then they did do it on their own. And here's a little couple. I just, I just like that wee lady um, getting ready to, to move out of that flat and move into one of the new refurbished ones. This is um, just down at the corner of, of Reedvale Street and Sword Street. I keep doing that. Reedvale Street and Shot Sword Street, and this was the first building in the area to get sandblasted. And you can see all the build the tenements around. It's the same, it's the same buildings, it's the same houses, but they were all black because of the pollution. So um, our little committee at the time managed to persuade. Um, they, they actually managed to persuade the council at the time. Can you sand, do a test and sandblast our building and see what it looks like? And that um, that beautiful red sandstone was underneath, and nobody nobody knew that the tenements looked like that around here. So um, that again led to you know led to a little bit of development grant that the association had then demonstrated that they could manage and handle, and that you know led to further further redevelopment. I just thought I'd put this <laughs> awful, but well, this was the picture that sealed the deal for a lot of people that owned <laughs> that that owned a flat, but were maybe reluctant about selling it back to the association, and you know. If someone said to you, you can have this, <laughs> this was um, this is what sealed the deal for a lot of the, the people who were living in the area at the time. So that was the first ever fitted bathroom in the Reedvale area, which is quite something. I'm slightly disappointed. In my memory, the suite was either puce or avocado. I'm disappointed that it's brown, but um, I, it's still horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then this, um, this is Thompson Street School. This is, uh, my living room actually looks out into the front of this building. And I mentioned earlier my, my fellow committee member and friend, Irene, had done a sit-in because um, this building was going to get knocked down. So this was a, a functioning primary school until 1984. And then again, you know, the council was like, well, we can't afford to run it anymore. We're just going to close it. You still see this now. You see, you see these buildings all over the city, schools that are getting mothballed until they can either fall down or until the council can sell them on to 
a private developer. It's just happened up in Hanson Street a few weeks ago. Um, Kim Long, the local councillor, done a really good job of um, raising awareness about, about this problem. But it used to happen in the 80s as well. Do you know, it's like the same old tricks. So this building, this beautiful school got closed and it was left to get ruined and then local tenants heard that it was go that was going to get demolished as well. So they broke in and staged a sit-in and there was a big negotiation with the council and the council sold it to the association for a pound. And you know, it's pepper corn rent. The, the association had to redevelop the building, which they did in like a number of stages over the next three or four years. And that's it now, and, it, and it's flats. But that's, if you did see the documentary about this area, History of Our Street, that's Irene's house there. And um, Irene's not to be messed with either. But Irene, um, in the documentary, there's a really good moment where she says, well, where would you rather live, here or here? And she points at the tower blocks, the, the Gallagate sisters, which have since been demolished. And um, it's, you know, that's our, our big point. You've got to do it yourself, otherwise we would have ended up in, in high rise like that. And I'm not knocking high rise either. I've li um, we've lived in high rise flats before as well. So, but it was a really good point Irene made where this has been designed and kept for the community. So yeah, this I've just got a couple of pictures of. Um, these are gala days. Gala days. Um, Used to be rife in the area. I don't think I've seen a gallery for quite some time, but um, there's always been a real appetite for for that additional stuff. So I've talked a lot about the housing and how the house improving the housing improved the area, but the the committee at Reedvale realised quite quickly if you just make houses and rent them out. You know, you're, you're just another landlord. You don't really know who's living here. You don't know what they need. You can't mitigate problems in the area. So we've got a... Where, where the Reedvale office is, that's the Reedvale Neighbourhood Centre. And it's, you know, it's had a number of various reincarnations over the years. But the Neighbourhood <coughs> Centre um, is used to host a number of classes for local adults, local children. It's got a community cafe in it. Um, there's just an area where teenagers can can um, spend their time at night. Um, there's also another, there's the Reedvale Adventure Play Area just along the road, and that's an award-winning facility for, for younger children. And that's that's been there maybe for, for nearly 25 years now as well. Uh, there's the allotments at the bottom of the street there. That's one of our more recent initiatives. Uh, the allotments were... At the time, back in 2008, there were the first allotments to, like, purpose-built allotments to be built in Glasgow for the last 60 years. So that was, um, it was just about using land in the area, which if we didn't use it, someone else would, and they'd probably use it for something which didn't benefit our tenants or benefit our community whatsoever. So, it, you know, there's, a, there's another initiative that we have in that in the local area, I wouldn't say you see hundreds of police about, but a pound from every resident's rent pays towards pays police overtime. And you know, there's maybe another argument there about paying people paying for public service, but that's something that, that we decided to do for a period of time. I think we're probably going to stop it soon because you know the, the police patrolling is different, but that's something we decided to do at a time when there was a lot of trouble with people hanging about in the in the streets at night and tenants not feeling safe and that's how, how we tackled it. So a lot of the initiatives that happen within the area happen because you know that problem came about and, and it had to be solved. I put, I put this quote in because, and I'm, I'm really gutted I forgot to bring them with me, but our director who retired two years ago, Rob Joyner, um, wrote a little book and he wrote a book about the first 25 years of the association and uh, you know it was just kind of a lot of what I've told you but there was this quote in it as well which is very unlike Rob and it's very unlike the rest of the content in the book but um, I just thought I'd put it in there for, for today because um, Rob was a real innovator he was a really um, 
it was a real thinker. And uh, I've never known another housing association director like Rob, and I think um, Rob Joyner's led us, led Reedvale down a path that perhaps a lot of other associations haven't gone down. I just thought I'd put this picture in as well. That's, that's John Butterley again, and the, the supported living, which is the building behind this one, was um, named after John because basically he saved the area from the hammer, but he didn't know that the building was going to be named after him when, when he pulled the little curtain. I think he thought it would be called the Queen Elizabeth Old Folks Home or something, and it wasn't. It was named after him. So it's just I wanted to demonstrate the, the legacy that these people and what they've done for us have, have through the community. Oh, put that wee couple there at the end. I'm not quite, I'm not quite finished because um, that all sounds... That must all sound... It's, it's great. What, what people have achieved over the last 40 years is fantastic. A lot of housing associations in Glasgow are 40 years old and we're all reaching the same point. We're reaching the point where committee members are getting older. They're quite fatigued. Um, the way people live and the way people want to live is quite different to what their perceptions are. A lot of Housing associations have retained the same staff, so over the next five years, a lot of places that provide affordable housing in Glasgow, the directors are due to retire. We're in that situation here at the moment where Linda Scott, who's our acting director at the moment, was the first ever employee of Reedvale Housing <coughs> Association, and she's going to retire, and I'm going to have to lead my committee in recruiting a new director, and the thought terrifies me because I worry that someone will come and start looking at turnover, profit, loss, rental increase, you know, and not get the community ethos. Because if somebody comes in and doesn't get your community ethos, I think we're finished. And I also believe that just the housing movement in general has never felt under more threat because of all the issues that, that I've told you about, you know things that are facing their tenants, be it the way they receive their benefits, the way they don't receive their benefits, the kind of contracts people are getting for work, the way people perceive their local area. There's so many threats out there that the government, you know, it's, it's the government that are putting it upon us, but housing associations are having to use their staff to mitigate all these other, all these other things that we're expected to deal with, which is more than housing. Which I guess brings me back to why I'm sitting here telling you all this, all this story. Um, if we lose our post office, it's, it's going to be an unbelievable impact on the community. But I feel that there's a different kind of impact if we lose market. And the thought of market not being here anymore frightens me, do you know, and, and it frightens me because um, when I think, of, you know, there was the photos there of all these, these gala days, these kids, it's so hard to engage with the community. I don't know, I mean, I've, I've spoken to the, the board and, and the committee in the past about what's it like working here and who comes in and who local talks to you and stuff, but people tend not to, you know, if there isn't an issue or if it's if it's something they think's not for them, they won't get involved. We experience it at the Reedvale Committee. Um, God, there's even cliques, cliques and things in the slimming world that happens along at the hall that you hear about and you think, God, what? <laughs> come on. You know, so there's a lot of these, a lot of these issues that I, um, I believe in, and I'm, I'm keen to hear a little bit of dialogue about it today, about how Reed Vale and Market can maybe touch base again, do you know? I think we've both just been, we've thought the galleries operating, they're in that space, everything's going fine. And we've never really had, a, we've not actually had a dialogue for a long time, because we've just been quite happy that the gallery are here getting on with it. The galleries, yeah, they're under threat. Yeah, we've, we've made this situation come about. But I'd like to think that we can talk about the future of the two organisations together and how we can work together and what that means for this community 
and what an example we can set for other associations or other cu cultural organisations that want to do something a little bit different, that, that want to do something that's a little bit more autonomous, but it's an unlikely partnership, but it's a good one because I don't know any other um, associations that have got an initiative like this one. So I think... I think that's all I've got to say, but... Right, I'm sure there's going to be an enormous amount of people who want to come in on that. What I'm going to say is that we'll maybe just do about 10 minutes of questions now, but after the final talk of the day, we're going to have a roundtable discussion where there's plenty of time to, to kind of come back to these issues. So. The, the next 10 minutes is not exhaustive. There was a question here, first of all. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh. Um, I'm intrigued. How do your um, tenants use market gathering? Do they, do they enjoy it? Do they come in? Do they interact with it? Too? That's maybe a question for the market committee, because I actually... I'm not entirely sure. I'd like to think... I think the problem that we have is, as I've said, we've just said there's a species just got on with any problems, let us know. But um, I, I, I'm not sure, Penny, how the, the committee members or the artists that are here in the day know if someone's our tenant or not. Do you know, I'm not sure if, if that dialogue ever takes place. I certainly know from my own committee, from my own committee meetings, um, the, the committee are quite... The committee are not, my committee aren't the audience, they, 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 they wouldn't come, they're quite happy that market's here and they're happy that, that something interesting is happening and as I said before, we're, we're happy that it's not another bookies or, you know, tanning shop or um, whatever else goes on along the road, but I don't know how many of our tenants, have, have, maybe that's an interesting question though, it's maybe worth finding it. How, how can we find that out? Oh, we got so some next yeah, door. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm keen to be a liaison point between between our organisation and yours. I think it's it's time that dialogue took place. Yeah, this this timing is, is perfect. I don't think just for the situation between Reedvale Market and the post office. I certainly know that um, a lot of these kind of discussions are going on in other spaces as well about what the role of you know these cultural resources are and it's. And what what it means to us as we'd fail and what it means to to maybe the the surrounding arts community as well. I think um, I really enjoyed when I first met with with your committee. I thought I thought it was it was a really interesting night. And I remember when I, I basically I sat and and I, I did what I've just done to you and said, well, this happened and then that happened and this is who we are. And the the committee said, could you come and see that at our symposium? And I said, I'd love to. I'd actually love to. And I gave you guys the the little books, the first twenty five years. And I just think even that little step of when when you've got a new committee that comes on board, you, you have that book. You can watch that documentary, and you just get a sense of what this place is. I often quite find it quite hard to describe what this place is because there's just so many levels of history, of <coughs> policy changes and of things that have happened as well. No. <laughs> <laughs>
the organisation and obviously the committee and market only lasts for two years. Yeah. I guess you think there'd be any benefit to changing that model and you know, the committee perhaps serving longer. I guess just the contrast between them is quite interesting. Controversially I do. There was but there was there's been a a piece of policy introduced recently by the Scottish Housing Regulator. The housing that the affordable housing sector is massively regulated compared to the private rented sector, which is, I think, you know, it's it's pulls apart, it's pulls apart. But there's now a thing come in called the nine year rule. So if any of my committee members have been a member for over nine years, you have to ask them, you know, you have to invite them in for an appraisal and write down and make sure the regulator knows they're still worthy of note and that they can come to meetings and stay awake and all the rest of it. But I think it's it's a really interesting question because an assumption I made was that there's, and even though I know, like yourself, Martin, and all the others that I've known through the market committee, there was, I didn't, there was the two and a half year thing, but you assume that other people on the board, someone, you think, someone will have been there the whole time. Someone will know the whole story, and it's like polar opposites. Do you know that that transient? That's a transient. Um, it's not a transient community, but you know there, there is. There's two and a half years versus twenty five years. That's a totally different thing. I would love to have more committee members on board at Reedvale. It's actually the holy grail at the moment. That's whenever you go to a housing conference or you um, we get a speaker at the forum about housing management, it's how do you get new committee members on board and um, I wonder if at market, you know, there's there's possibly new graduates coming out or maybe new artists that are moving to the, the city that need experience or connections and I certainly think there's something in, in our housing association that, that, that we could learn from that I'd like to think so anyway Some people, um, depending on on the kind of benefits they get, and I feel I feel a bit kind of under equipped to explain. I've never um, I've never been in this situation myself, but I believe that a lot some a lot of our tenants can't get a bank account where you can get direct debits off of it. The post every everyone is entitled to a basic bank account, at which t at this moment in time is only provided by the post office. So if you, say you came out of prison, or say you were receiving a large number of benefits, or say, um, say you were someone living on your own, maybe, um, maybe you, you weren't able to cope with, with dealing with your own finances, which I, I don't do a great job of it myself, to be honest, but you know, there's a lot of people who, there's a, a number of scenarios in their life will mean that they're only entitled to a basic bank account, which we can all access with a post office. If you showed up at to like the Bank of Scotland or the Royal Bank to get a, to get an account, you would probably take a household bill with you, and you would probably take your passport with you. And there'll be some of our tenants, not just our tenants, people in the private rented sector as well, or other housing associations across Glasgow, will be in the position where they don't have either of those things because their circumstances mean that they, they don't deal with the, their own bills themselves or that they don't ha have a passport or ID. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of bank accounts out there now that you have to pay for, you know. Yes, you're you're paying ten ten pounds a month. That's I think that's quite a lot of money to have a basic bank account. Yeah. Like so much to get a bank account. And if like you know, not the easiest one you can get in the church is something like twelve pounds a month, which if you have lots of money, that's nothing. If you have no money, twelve pounds a month is like 
Yeah, especially if you're... And you can't claim benefits, so even though just moving from abroad makes it impossible. Totally. Or if you're receiving, like, £55 a week or yeah. 65 every two weeks, do you know? I think there's about there's about fifty five or sixty housing associations in in sort of Glasgow and in, in the surrounding areas. In Glasgow itself, there's no such thing as a council house. We don't have council housing in Glasgow. Um, GHA, which you know is an affordable provider, as far as I have heard, but it's. You know, it's not a public sector organisation. They're a limit, limited liability partnership of Glasgow City Council. They farmed all their council housing out and it's run in a different way. What really annoys me about GHA is they replicate the community controlled model and they make themselves look like a community controlled model. And they can do that because they've got a huge... Pre they've got, you know, they've got staff that are generating press all the time and, you know, they can, they're sending out these messages all the time. But if you were to, I, I think this myself quite often, if you were to go ahead and try and start a housing association now, how would you do it? You know, because obviously this area where I know most about, certainly I've got a lot of friends up in Millen Bank, which is at the top end of Denston. There's Hag Hill, there's Small and Diner, there's Bridgeton and Domarnock. You know, there's all these little East End housing associations. And they were all born out of the same situation. No public body was going to help them in the property if, if they didn't buy it for a pound or buy it off each other or whatever they did to make it happen. You know, it, it wouldn't have happened. And um, I quite, you know, the, the value that's put on land now, the, the readiness of public developers to swoop on any patch of land and call it luxury flats, that wasn't there at the time. And that's something that worries me quite a lot. You know, if you wanted to replicate this model now, you probably couldn't. Yeah. And that's... And, and how you're saying that there's, you know, the average age is, is 57. Uh-huh. You know, um, on the you know, committee, uh, is it obviously part and parcel of young people never being able to afford, you know, uh, a house? Yeah. <laughs> so what, where would the incentive be to join a housing system? Exactly, and if, if you can't start if you can't start something like that yourself, who is going to do it? There is no there's there isn't enough housing there isn't enough stock in the UK. Never mind Scotland. Never mind Glasgow, and the the model. I mean, our association isn't going to get any bigger. We we manage and run these streets, and that's it. A lot of associations have the same ethos, so that they can stay small and stay community controlled and not have to get other governing bodies involved. So the model that I've described, it's fantastic. And the, the, the committee have achieved a lot and I've inherited a fantastic story that I can tell other people. But is the model fit for purpose now? I don't think it is because there's no way you could start something like that now. I guess it links to like gas as well. Like, uh you know, the, the question of longevity we were talking about is, you know, how, how could you write like a sort of manual for, for gas? How could you write a manual for Reaver? I mean, it's so, such a complex organisation, but, you know, like you say, how do you sort of, yeah, facilitate the replication of, of community housing? So yeah. Seems to me that and keeping that community control yeah. as well. But letting the community realise the value of that control, because at the moment, you know, we struggle to get them on board to be part of the committee. So, yeah. Ideological barriers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, 
Right, um, I'm going to ask everyone to store any more questions until the end of the day um, when we'll have an opportunity to come back to this. But for the moment, thank you so much. For